have a great modeler with us tonight, Kevin Tully. And uh, with that said, I will turn it over to Kevin and talk Kevin and uh, look forward to uh, his discussion. Kevin, thanks so much for coming. Well, you're welcome. Um, thanks for for having me. Um, you guys, I don't know how many of you even know who I am. I'm my name's Kevin Tully. I'm not. I haven't been in any magazines or anything that I know of, uh, so I, I'm kind of a nobody, I think. But uh, um, I own a company called Steel Mill Modeler Supply, and uh, so I, I'm a steel mill modeler, and um, uh, I've been modeling since I was four. My brother got me my first model car when I was four, and uh, I got into trains um, sometime around... Uh, when I was maybe seven and um, uh, I was actually out of modeling for some time when I was in the service. I, I uh, did some modeling until um, right around Desert Storm and then I pretty much fell out of it for years. When I was stationed in Alaska, I joined the um, Military Society of Modeling Eng Model Railroad Engineers that's on Elmendorf Air Force Base. And got back into it and then when I left there I didn't really do any modeling for um, quite some time after I left Alaska and I, I actually have only been back into it for about uh, three or four years. I'm a member of the uh, uh, Prairie Scale Model Railroaders in Lombard, Illinois um, where I've been building a um, pretty much a full-scale byproduct coke works um, that's laid out like Thomas Coke works in Alabama, but uh, linearly, instead of, if you've seen a, a layout of Thomas, it's kind of a big square property. And um, all the plants are more linear on mine. And uh, I, I didn't use all of the buildings and, and appliances that they have at Thomas or had at Thomas. Um, I added some others in that are, I just found more interesting than what they had at Thomas, but they are all the same devices. There's a significantly larger primary cooler that I used than what they had at Thomas. But, uh, and then um, uh, once I finish that, uh, I'm gonna move on to an ore pier that will be uh, pretty much a carbon copy of uh, Pennsylvania Railroad Pier 122 at uh, Philadelphia. And once that's finished, I'll move on to our big steel mill that we're gonna build on at our, at our, our club. We've got a 7,000 square foot uh, layout room with about an 800 square foot club room that also has layout in it. It's all one big layout. There's uh, 40 scale miles of main line and HO scale on it. And the minimum radius uh, on the, on the um, curves on the layout, uh, if I remember correctly, the minimum radius is something like eight feet. So uh, you Lots of times see guys running 100 car trains that actually look kind of small in the layout. Um, but uh, anybody that has any questions for me, I mean, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, but anybody that's got modeling questions, uh, I suppose I could answer. Kevin, I have a friend of mine who uh, is starting to build a layout here where I live. And he is modeling Baltimore area. That's where he grew up. And he is intending to have a very large sawmill, uh, excuse me, uh, steel mill complex mm -hmm. on it. And so you said you have a company called Steel Mill Modeler Supply? Yes. Uh, you have kits or what's the story? So I, I have some things that are, they're not entire model kits, although I am working on, um, I've, got, uh, I've got a prototype here for a scale, a prototype size blast furnace. Okay. Um, this is actually the blast furnace that comes with the Walders kit. Mm -hmm. And if you scaled it, it's actually like about a hundred ton furnace, which would be around 1900. So that, that'd be fine if you were modeling like early steam or turn of the century. Right. Um, this is uh, furnace E from Sparrows Point. And um, this is a, a 400 ton furnace. So you can see that it's significantly different in size. And all this is HO scale, right? Yeah, these are HO, but I also, I sell everything in N, S, and O also. Okay. I just um, think that would be an O scale, which is my, my, my scale of choice, but. I mean, o gets kind of expensive. Um, <laughs> you know, I've got, uh, uh, 
thought I had a, uh, yeah. So this is a, this is an end scale basic oxygen furnace uh, scrap charging box. Mm -hmm. And in end scale, these are about, um, I think they're about $7 or $10. And in um, HO, the same one is about $25. And in O scale, they become more like about $120. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's all based on the amount of material that my printer uses. Right. And this is not um, uh, filament printing. This is uh, SLA, stereolithography. Um, so you can see the, uh, well, maybe you can't, but the, yeah. the, the texture is really, really smooth. There's no layer lines in it. Um, I've got these, I've got these neat little, um, these are uh, calcium carbide containers that are uh, from like the thirties up until about the fifties. And uh, they ship these in gondolas. So they're, it's kind of a neat load to have, but uh, um, I've had, I have a customer in Australia that's no scaler and he ordered a bunch of things from me. And Is their first name Neville? Yeah. Neville. Neville. Yeah, he's got two pictures in the most recent issue of O-Scale Trains of his sawmill, of his uh, steel mill. Yeah, so his steel mill, I he ordered a BOF charging box and a bunch of ingot molds, and um, I think he ordered ordered a, uh, a P and H ladle beam and a charging ladle because he has a BOF uh, on his layout. But what he what we didn't communicate about and what he he f neglected to tell me was that his BOF is not O scale because in O scale it would be just gigantic. I mean, BOF buildings are like two miles long, the real ones. Mm -hmm. And um, and they're, they're three or 400 feet high and in O scale that would be ridiculous. So he built it scaled down, um, but I sent him all these components to scale because that's what I wanted. And uh, you know, the BOF charging box is enormous. Um, I wish I had one sitting here in, in HO, but they're, I mean, they're, they're, this, they're bigger than a, like a 38 foot hopper in HO. Wow. And um, so you can imagine what that would be like in O scale. So do you have a, do you have a website? Yeah, it's, if you just Google steel mill model or supply, you'll, you'll see the website and there's hundreds of products on there. I'll make sure my friend Jay gets 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 a hold of that for you there. Yeah, and, and I've actually had a few S scale guys start to order things, and I'm I'm actually really enthused about that because there's it's really kind of a growing scale. It seems to be like not too big um, right. for a guy with a medium sized house, and it's not maybe for an older guy. It's easier to work on because the, the the stuff is a little bigger, and there's more and more suppliers for it. Right. And um, the thing that um, I try to market to those guys, and, and actually any of you, you don't have to be a steel mill modeler for a lot of the things that I have. If you have any kind of heavy industry, um, um, tended to use with either. Ever hey, Kevin, you're actually cutting in and out right now, just so you have a heads up. Oh, yeah, that might be, that might be the, um, my uh, router. Um, it, it's just that time of night. Everybody's watching television around here on their routers. So sorry about that, guys. Hey, um, not a problem. I, just figured I'd, I figured I'd let you know. I, I go through the same thing, Kevin, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but it, it <coughs> blast rocked, uh, or even PVC. Uh, tubing the the uh, like the Walder's downcomer on the blast furnace um, is actually not seven eighths tubing it's this goofball metric size probably because those are all made by tricks in um, Germany and um, and so you know but I make a fitting that will go from the Walder stuff to either seven eighths plastruct or um, half inch uh, PVC is actually seven eighths on the outside. It's really close. And, and uh, believe it or not, in HO scale, there are in a mill there are uh, 
pipes that are bigger than that even. I think an HO scale uh, seven eighths would be something like a um, 86 inch pipe. And um, the stuff on the BOFs are gigantic. I mean, they're like 10, 10 or 12 foot pipes. But, uh, but the nice thing is, is the fittings don't care what scale you're modeling. You know, in, in a bigger scale, the bolts are just smaller. Um, and there's all kinds of valves on there. And that's another thing, the valves don't care about what scale you're modeling because they're a particular size for a particular pipe. And um, so they can be valuable in kind of anybody's scale. But, uh, but I've been pretty enthused about that. I don't know if any of you guys are S scalers, but I've, I've been enthused about the S scale guys starting to buy things. Well, I'm an, o, I'm an O scale guy, but um, how did you get into steel mill modeling? Um, so I don't know if any of you were the same way I was, but when I was a little kid and I saw stuff like the NASA crawler, um, that kind of thing just fascinates me. Uh, the big, um, the big uh, drag line excavators. And uh, as a kid, I just liked anything that was a giant piece of machinery the Saturn V rockets. Um, it's just kind of mind boggling that uh, people can create that kind of stuff and, uh, and it works, especially in a steel mill. And the first time I went by a steel mill, um, I, when I was stationed in North Dakota, I would have to drive past Chicago to go home. I'm from Western New York. And, um, you know, of course I would drive past uh, Sparrows Point, um, or not Sparrows Point, Burns Harbor, and Gary and see all the big steel mills. And one time I got off the highway and just drove, you know, down one of the streets that was near the mill. And I just was in awe of how gigantic everything was. And um, much like a lot of you guys, um, I assume, uh, when you learn the history of something for the railroad you model or an industry you're modeling, um, you learn the history of it or the science behind it or how the plant is actually plumbed or something like that. Um, I just find this stuff fascinating and I think I was drawn to steel mills because they're gigantic and um, I was in the military when Walders released the first series of the uh, steel mill kits and um, so I, I did the subscription if you guys remember there was a subscription where you would get a piece of the mill every month and I think it was like 90 bucks a month or something like that and um, I just I thought it was cool when it all came uh, each month, and uh, I actually had that stuff shelved forever while I was in the service. And then uh, when I got back into it, I actually walked into um, the train club when I decided to get back into trains about three years ago. And our train club, the guys were giving me a tour. The president and one of the um, project managers was giving me a tour of the layout room. And there were these shelves off in this corner that, and there was some, you know, there's like in a lot of model train clubs, there's pipes in the ceiling. And um, I happened to look on the shelving and I recognized a, a partially assembled Coke battery. And then I looked up on the top shelf and here's these two blast furnaces all partially assembled up in the rafters. And I'm like, wow, you guys have some steel mill stuff. And they're like, oh yeah, there's going to be a steel mill on the layout if we can find a steel mill modeler. So I said, well, I'll join the club. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got voluntold that I was building the mill. So, and uh, voluntold, I haven't heard that one before. Yeah, that's a military term. You get voluntold to do things. Uh, <laughs> that's what my dad said. Never uh, volunteered for anything when I went in the service. <laughs> yeah, right. You always look down and never stare anybody in the face. And yeah. yeah. So uh, <clears throat> the nice thing was was when they showed me where the steel mill section was going to be in the layout room. Um, you know, the, a lot of guys to model a mill is kind of a, a pipe dream because there just isn't room in a normal human's house for a steel mill. And people don't realize just how enormous all that stuff is uh, and how much real estate it takes up. And, um, and the funny thing about mills, if you look at an aerial view of one, um, everything is gigantic and they have all this real estate, but like every square foot of of uh of land that's within a steel mill is somehow used for something um and it's just insane i mean they they hang these big pipe racks in the sides of buildings and they'll demolish the building years later and they don't demolish the parts of the building where the pipe racks are hanging on the building they just leave these 
like sections of gutted buildings standing because they don't have any other way to suspend the pipes and the electrical uh, cables running through the mill. And um, so when you do that on a layout, you can, you can model a, 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 a small portion of a mill, but to do it the right, you know, to actually model a mill, you either have to model your entire layout as a mill, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of guys do, or, um, or you just have to have a club situation like uh, the one that we have. Our mill will be 50 feet long, um, and it will vary in width from about 22 inches to probably six feet. And um, we'll have four, four blast furnaces and an open hearth furnace with about uh, probably about four or five open hearths inside of it and a BOF up against the backdrop. It will just be a backdrop building. But oh, where's, um, your, where's your club at? It's in Lombard, Illinois. Oh, okay. So okay. Lombard is like a western suburb of, of Not Chicago. Not for me at all. I'm over at South Bend. Oh, yeah. So you could easily, you could easily come visit sometime. If you go on our, um, if you're on Facebook and you go, uh, there's a um, there's a Facebook page called Prairie Scale Modelers Bethlehem Works, and um, that's kind of my personal page for the club. And I've got a lot of photos of the Coke battery, the Coke Works on there. The Coke Works is 30 feet long. So what's the actual name of the club? Prairie Scale Model Railroaders. Oh, Prairie. 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 Yeah. Prairie. Midwest. Yeah. Scale, but you know, so Facebook. We actually, we I, I've actually gotten. I, I'm, there's a there's a really great Facebook page called called Steel Mill Modeling. I think it's called Steel Mill Modeling. Let me make sure it's not Steel Mill Modelers. I'm pretty sure it's Steel Mill Modeling. Um, and one of the if any of you guys are yeah Steel Mill Modeling. And the great thing about the pages is there's a. Uh, Gosh, there's got to be about 2,000 members on it from all over the world. And there's some really crazy experience. Yeah, there's 2,200 members. And that's also Facebook? Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people are kind of a little nervous about Facebook or they're, you know, it's uh, it's like they're afraid it'll steal their soul or whatever. <laughs> but um, I think the great thing about this particular group and a lot of other groups on Facebook, whether they be modeling or for the military or racing or whatever, is that, uh, you know, the guy that runs this Facebook group, um, he's a, uh, he's a Christian and, you know, people may or may not be Christians, but the one thing that he does because he's of his faith is there's no swearing on the page. There's no ragging on someone else's models on the page. There's no politics on the page at all. And if you, preach those different things that he's outlawed from the page, he just deletes you. And everybody actually just kind of, you know, abides by it. And the other really great thing about the page is that um, there, if there's 2,000 model or, or if there's 2,000 people on the page, maybe half of them or a little more are modelers. Some of them are enthusiasts and a lot of them are either modelers, enthusiasts, modelers, and enthusiasts and former mill workers. And the great thing about that is, is that you're modeling something. Um, I had a gentleman ask me one time, I sell these little lamps or I did, I can't, I can't get them right now because of the, the COVID scare. Um, the guy isn't making them, but um, I sell these little platform lamps and um, a guy said, well, where do these all go on a blast furnace? And I, I honestly didn't know. And I looked in a lot of my reference books and I couldn't find anything that told me. So I posed the question on the page and like an hour later, a guy answered and said, yeah, I worked, I worked for 20 years at Burns Harbor and I was an electrician and my job was to change light fixtures and light bulbs, which get ruined a lot because of the vibration in the plants. And, um, this guy knew where they all went. I sent him a diagram of a blast furnace and he put little red X's on where all the, where all the, the lamps would go. So, if you want to be kind of prototype, now I have a diagram of where all the lamps go on a typical blast furnace. And um, I've asked other questions on there and there were guys, you know, I asked some questions about a Coke works and a guy had worked at a Coke works and he was uh, not just a, you know, a coal shoveler. He was a guy that managed the plant and um, he knew where all the pipes went and answered all my questions. And typically if you ask a question on that page, 
uh, you'll have an answer from a guy that actually did the job um, within a few hours. And I, I have yet to see anybody ask a question and not find an employee that did that job in a mill. So it's really, it's a really great reference source, you know. Cool. Let's see so, uh, this uh, uh, plant that you uh, have it, have uh, researched. What's that? What's the oldest? Uh, what's the oldest uh, plant that you researched or mill? I should say. So, um, because I have the company, I kind of research most of them in the rail in the railroad era. <clears throat> you know, there were blast furnaces in this country, little ones little tiny blast furnaces since almost revolutionary war days. <clears throat> and um, so I, I have looked at pieces of mills back to the early 1900s because most of the steam engine model, the steam era modelers, um, most of those guys are doing kind of more transition era, but there's a few, there's one guy is a good friend of mine that models uh, about 1925. And so he has asked me for things, um, you know, and there's different, they, the construction methods were different back then, you know, the downcomers, the big elbows and the downcomers that are segmented elbows in that, that era would have been riveted together. So I did a little bit of digging and found a photo of one uh, in one of my books, actually. I got this book that was on uh, when they were building um, U.S. Steel down at Burns Harbor, like originally. And um, there were, had just happened to be a photo in the book of these guys, you know, the, the typical 1900s photo with the guys standing with their arms on, you know, on their shovel or whatever, of the standing next to this downcomer elbow. And it, I could, it was a really good photograph. So I was able to, you know, to draw one up and print one and, and send him some. So probably early 1900s stuff. I try to supply things, like I have stove kits. If you look at the Walder stoves for the blast furnace, they're really just kind of shells with a round top on them. They're called three pass stoves and they're, um, uh, they're actually the ones in the kit. The Walder's kit is kind of a mismatch. The, the furnace column is like from the early 1900s and the stoves are from like the seventies, the design. <clears throat> so I sell stove kits <clears throat> and of course I want to provide things to guys that model any era. So, really kind of the only stove kit that I don't have is for the, uh, I have a stove kit for what's called a Whitwell stove, which was a turn of the century stove. Um, I don't have anything from like the turn of the century style Whitwell stoves to the fifties. And it's because there just aren't a lot of photos. You know, cameras were kind of cumbersome then. Um, they didn't really have, uh, um, you know, the camera guy could carry with him like a little Kodak Brownie or something. <laughs> and um, so you don't get as many images. Plus, I don't know that people really saved that kind of stuff, but you don't get as many images of guys that would just take a camera to work with them and photograph something. So you really have to find photos that are more like a builder's photo from a company that made, um, it's taken me like two years to find this one kind of stove burner um, that they use to heat the stoves. Um, to find enough photos of it, I had one photo forever, but I couldn't see what was how it was designed on the other side, and I couldn't find any patent drawings of it. And um, I, I recently found an image that appears to be the same kind of burner that's from the other side of it, so now I could actually draw one up. But I do have stuff that's like that really early 1900s turn of the century, and then I have 1950s and 1960s and 1970s and there haven't been any new any new mills built since the 70s since the early 70s and so I don't have anything that anything from the 70s is what they're kind of still using so I, I there's really kind of no need to to uh, to produce anything for like the blast furnaces that's any more modern but uh, but like the uh, the some of the byproduct plant stuff that I have is is from the 30s and 40s and 50s because they build a lot of that stuff and it just mills mills can't be down for repairs or they don't like to be 
And so you'll find that they actually just use things until they absolutely fail. And then they'll take the thing and swap it out for something new. Um, so you really do, it's, they're really interesting building uh, facilities because you'll find buildings that were architecturally or obviously from like the twenties and right next to it will be some corrugated building that they built in 1995 and both buildings will still be in use. So it's, it's, it's a cool, I like that you can tell a story like our mill at the club. When I build it, I'm going to use a Walder's, the, the little tiny Walder's stove a furnace. And then next to it, I'm going to build some stuff that looks like it was built in the late thirties. And then I'm going to build uh, furnace E, which was built in the fifties. And, uh, build it as if it's under construction. And that way, when someone comes in and looks, I'm hoping what people will do is go, hey, how, how come none of these blast furnaces are the same? And uh, I'll be able to say, well, you know, the, the place was built and then they got more business, so they built more furnaces and then World War II happened, so they built two furnaces. And then after the war, it was prosperity, so they built another furnace. Because our layout's set in the, turn, in, in the, in the mid 50s, so. It's, it's post World War II, so there's can be lots lots of stuff like that on the layout. Yeah, I grew up uh, I grew up around uh, Troy, New York, which I guess was the the first uh, Iron City, I guess, uh, from what the, they pretty much tell and all that, which had uh, apparently the world's largest water wheel uh, in the one place. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm from uh, a town called Dalton, which is south of uh, Rochester. So I'm probably not very far from you. Uh, Troy is up, is it along the canal? I'm trying to think uh, where Troy is. Uh, Troy, Troy is ne next, uh, near Albany. Oh, okay, so that's way, that's way out east. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was gonna say, it's like, Rochester? Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, Rochester's way out west. But, but uh, Troy, New York, is literally right across the river from Albany. It's on, it's yeah. on my, it's basically on me and and Ed's side of the river. Yeah, I, I'm at, I've been I've only I'm from New York, but I've only actually been to New York City once, and that was on an airplane. I flew in. I don't remember where I was going, but I flew into LaGuardia, and I had to change planes and left. And and anything east of Syracuse, I've actually never been there. So. I always thought it was funny in the military guys would be like, Oh, I have a friend from New York city. Do you know him? And I'm like, Oh yeah, totally. You know, there's only like <laughs> you know, 8 million people in New York state. And it's, this, I know him <laughs> not much smaller than Texas. You know, I mean, it's just laid out differently. <laughs> yeah. I get the, yeah. When I traveled the country, I had the same thing. I had to say that I was specifically from where I was living at the time, which was Pittstown, New York, which was one of those, uh, small towns that, you know, the only reason why it's a town is because it was a three-way intersection. Yeah, right. That's the town I'm from. Dalton, Dalton, we called it, we had the, the blinking light at the four-way was, was out about a half a mile outside of town and there were about five streets in town. And the town was actually only there because there was a feed mill and a, uh, a water tower and a coaling dock for the Erie. They would stop there and, and take on coal and water, uh, like coming out of uh, Gang Mills going towards, uh, um, well, coming out of Hornell, uh, which was the main shops for the Erie before they headed up to Rochester. Yeah, it's, I would uh, say. If it's not, you know, nobody's, or Dalton, where's that? You know, nobody knows where, the, where that is. I remember, yeah. you remember our driver's licenses used to have the outline of New York State on them? Yep. Yeah. So guys would ask me if I, uh, how, like, you know, they thought New York was like the whole thing was city. And I'd say, oh, well, let me show you how big New York City was. So I'd take the license out, you know, I'd take the license out and I'd go, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to cover New York City with my thumb. And I'd go, I'd go like this. <laughs> and they'd go, really? What's the rest of the state? Um, <laughs> forest and, you know, mountains and farms and, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was I remember one time uh, taking a plane coming in uh, from Albany, and uh, you know the 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 announcement is like basically says, you know, it's like you know, please put your seatbelts on and all that. We're coming into Albany, New York, and uh, the people behind me says, 
when you were you're getting ready to land and all that. This is all farm services. Welcome to Albany, New York. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Probably thought you were going to land on the highway and they were just going to get out onto a bus and drive away, right? And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all a little well, that, tiny towns. That would be whatever. interesting. But that we have the same problem with Massachusetts. People think Boston is most of the state. Like yeah, out to sure. where I live, I live in basically dead center of the state. And people, I where I work, my office is basically in a truck stop. So we'll still, well, people say, yeah, I'm by Woburn or I'm, I'm in Boston. And we hear the, I'm in Boston all the time. And I said to one of them, I'm like, do you really know where Boston is? Yeah, it's right here. No, Boston's about 40 miles that way. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, people, people don't realize, you know, from my house in, uh, in, in Western New York to get to New York City, it's like a six or seven hour drive. <laughs> and they don't get that, you know, I don't understand. The state's that big. Yes, it's. Did you take geography in high school? It's it's a big state. It's really long and it's really tall when you get out into the east side of it. You know, but uh, yeah, I had I had uh, heard this one rumor uh, or this one story from a friend of mine that went to Germany because that's where she uh, that's where she's uh, her ancestors came from, and uh, she wound up going to a class and all that, and you know, it's like saying, oh yeah, I'm from New York. You know, I lived it live in uh, Pleasantdale, was the Bub Troy, and, uh, you know, they're showing him maps, and she's originally from Buffalo, New York, and one of the kids asked, you know, it's like, you know, since they saw the state and all that, they're like, going like, so do you, you know, because Germany is a lot smaller than the U.S., uh, they made, the, uh, one kid made the assumption of going like, so do you ride your bicycles to your parents' place afterwards? It's like, no, oh, it's 300 miles. Yeah, right. <laughs> My future steam modeler is right behind me there. <laughs> you want to say hi? Hi, I'm plus also. Plus also? What do you need? Um, I need a car and a lot of your erector set. Yeah. Cool. Ah, <laughs> uh, kids. You got an erector set? Yeah, he's got a wrecker set and Lego oh, and Lincoln logs and blocks and he doesn't he doesn't have any electric toys. My none of my kids ever had had a chance any of those toys. I had all those toys as a kid. Wrecker set, Lincoln logs. Well, not, not right now, buddy. Not right now. Okay. Yeah, unbelievable. For me, yeah, it was primary made, Legos. We made an agreement when um, I I own a fabrication business and when I hire people. Um, we've been open for 17 years and one of the things that I have noticed is that um, the younger people have they they can be good welders but they have zero imagination mm -hmm. and so in interviews I started asking guys um, did you play with Lego were you into model trains did you build model cars did you have a rector set they, of course they didn't know what that was but um, I found that the ones that were not modelers um, as kids and did not have Lego or, or, uh, or um, Lincoln Logs or anything like that. And oftentimes I would say, oh, you know, did you, did you play video games? Oh, yeah, I played video games all the time. Uh, and they had RC cars and stuff. But um, they just did not, I, I, did, I, you know, surmised that they didn't have any imagination because they were never – they never had to use their imagination. So, you know, the, the computer games did it for them and the electric toys did it for them. And therefore, you know, they just never developed an imagination. So when this guy came along, we made an agreement that he would not have any electric toys until he was, you know, maybe 10 or 12 years old. And um, in, his, in his class, he has the biggest imagination of, of the 10 kids that are in his class. Right. He's cute. I'll give him that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's and he knows he is. He's a charm. <laughs> Genius, also. Yeah, he gets that from me. <laughs> you know, that's actually an interesting thing to think about. Is because I work in the right, office okay. for my my with my father okay. for for our heating company. You know, I we we basically my family has basically been involved in the company for God almost thirty years at this point, and. Um, one of the things you notice with people when they get into something is the people who've never tried to do something mechanical are the ones who always have the most trouble right. when they first start. Right. Yeah. 
And I think you could safely say that's any industry that involves yeah, you use your brain. They can't, you know, in, in my, not just in my industry, a, a few years ago, I don't know, actually it's probably like 20 years ago, I heard someone use the phrase Imagineering. And of course then it was a made up word, but um, being the conjunction of imagination and engineering, it's actually a really accurate word. Uh, you can't engineer without imagination because you need to imagine a thing that doesn't exist and then figure a way out to, to make it exist. And uh, I really think that the younger generation, because their parents want them in front of the glass idiot box, he doesn't watch a lot of television. Um, and I'm very controlling about what he does watch. Um, you know, I, I really think that they have done their kids a disservice because uh, instead of dad changing the sink trap out when it's leaking, he calls in a plumber. Well, who's the dummy there? You know, the plumber's putting in a $6 part and charging the guy 150 bucks for the service call. Exactly. Uh, I mean, there's know. some stuff, don't get me wrong. There's some stuff you can't expect everyone to know. Like oh, no. yeah. with heating stuff, like I, I tell customers, don't screw with the burner. No, leave yeah. that to somebody That's who knows bad. what they're doing because it, you could, you know, we deal with oil. We don't deal with gas. With gas, you go boom. Oh, well, with oil, yeah. you'll smoke the house out and everyone's having a significant emotional event. Um, <laughs> I, I'm serious. You, you, you would love to hear some of the calls I have with people when the boiler's smoking and they're just panicking. Well, I'm like, know, I, I had a guy, uh, I build high end race cars and we had one at this big you know, this big uh, function that's a little bit like the NMRA convention, but it's called SEMA and it's about a thousand times bigger than the NMRA convention. But this guy, a friend of mine brought someone, one of his friends by and they were looking at the car and he, he lamented that he was putting a car together himself. But he, he needed somebody to wire it. And I said, well, what do you do for a living? And he said, well, I'm a plumber. And I said, well, why can't you wire this car? And he looked at me like I had a third eye and I said, he said, I'm a plumber. You didn't hear me. I said, I did hear you that you're a plumber. Why can't you wire this car? And he goes, but I'm not an electrician. I said, it doesn't matter that you're not an electrician. Wiring said, is not difficult once you know what you're doing. And I said, you're, you learn some of that anyway as a plumber. Yeah. Well, the, the thing that I related to him was I said, there's no difference between being an electrician and being a plumber in the basic principle of it. And he again looked at me like I had a third eye. And I said, look, you're dealing with water and volume and pressure and wiring deals with amperage and voltage and resistance. But both things are the same because you're carrying a medium in a conduit, whether it's a wire and electricity or pipe and water, you are still bringing the two things from a source the, the water main of the battery doesn't matter. You're carrying it in a, in a conduit of some kind and it's being consumed by appliances, whether the appliance is a radio or the instruments on the dashboard or a hot water heater and a faucet, it's still the same thing. And he, he had this kind of light bulb moment. He went, oh yeah. And I said, right, the battery is the main out in the street. The dash lights and the heater and all that stuff are all the appliances that you would normally be plumbing into a house. All you're doing is putting the water pipes between the battery and the appliances. And he, he really had an aha, aha moment. And I said, look, there's instructions that come with a painless wiring harness. There's no reason that you, if you can read the directions for putting a tankless water heater in a house, you can certainly do your car. And I hope that he went home and wired his car, but it was just, he was pigeonholed himself. And, you know, of course, as model railroaders, you can't pigeonhole yourself like that because you have to be an artist and a modeler and a, a carpenter and an electrician and a, um, you know, a, a set designer and all these other things. And I really try to express that to the parents that have young people. Like at the Steel Mill Modelers uh, Convention, I always, um, I, I always stand in front of this geriatric crowd who laments about how there's no young steel mill modelers and, and no mo young model railroaders. And I say to them, well, so none of you had children. Oh yeah, we have children. So none of you have grandchildren. Well, yeah, we have grandchildren. Well, stop telling them to stay away from grandpa's trains. <laughs> you don't want them near grandpa's trains. Get a four by eight sheet of plywood and go buy a Tyco 
or an Atherin train set and help them set it up and they can have that and you can teach them how to be careful with things and whatever and, and how to set the track in place and put a nail in and all that. And when they're, you know, when they're, when you're confident that they're good at playing with that, then invite them, get them some inexpensive engines and put an inexpensive decoder in them and bring them and teach them. Cause now you have to be a, a electronics wizard too and bring them to your big layout. You know, there's a reason that Bachman makes Thomas the Tank Engine HO scale train engines. It's so that you can buy your kid one of those and when they're 10 or six or whatever, they can come run that on your big layout. You know, Gunner has been going to the local swap meet train swap meet with me since he was he, he went with me when he was little little i would just put him i'd carry him i carried him everywhere and um when he got big enough to to uh walk by himself um you know i i told him everything was for looking not for touching and if he wanted to look at something to ask me and then as he got older i would have him ask the guy behind the table and he never, we go, we pay the early fee because he's still not very, you know, he's, he's six, but uh, I always pay the early fee because the, some of the guys weren't really paying attention to having a little kid there and they would knock him down. So I would pay the early fee so we could go and there wasn't as many people there. But um, he's always very polite. He, he's starting to learn how money works because, I'll, you know, he takes two, three dollars with him and he wants to buy, you know, matchbox cars or something and he's got Lionel trains so he can buy it a Lionel, you know, like a Chinese Lionel train car. I don't, I don't even look at the collector stuff. There's plenty of the Chinese knockoff stuff that he can play with. And if he breaks the grab iron off or something like that, it's not a travesty. Um, but he's very polite, you know, and it's, it's, I always tell these guys, look, you know, stop telling your kids to stay away from your layout and teach them how to be careful around your layout and how to be respectful and teach them how to model. He sits down and I buy Atherin blue box cars and he sits down and he helps me build Atherin blue box cars. I mean, they say on the blue box, um, don't they say on these things that they're for like, yeah, seven years and older. I mean, he's, he's six. He can, he can sit down and help me put the screws in and stuff. And when a blue box car, you know turned... that? Oh, sorry. Uh, I was gonna say when my granddaughter was 11 days old, I got her her first train set. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you got to you know, start I mean, them young. Yeah. yeah, I got him O scale because, you know, the same reason that Lionel and realistically, I think they invented O scale because it was just the time, the era and the technology was easier to do in, in that scale. But, um, but I got, I mean, one of the reasons they invented O scale, I believe, was because it was big. It was the flanges were big. It was easy to put on the track and kids could play with it. And, so that's what I got him. And now he's getting a little bit older and he's really interested. He goes over to the layout with me and he's my switchman. He runs ahead of me with a stool and stands up and throws the switches for me when we need to go into a siding or whatever. And um, he's probably the only six year old in the Midwest that knows all the whistle signals for steam engines. Um, you know, and it's pretty funny because we go to like the local NMRA thing and the guys are like, wow, you really know a lot about trains. And I'm like, yeah, he knows the whistle signals for steam engines. And a lot of the older guys are like, I don't even know the whistle signals for steam engines. <laughs> you know. So what, what was the name of your company again, Kevin? Steel Mill Modelers Supply. Steel Mill Modelers. Okay. But, uh, you know, if we don't, if we don't all, I'm kind of a, Obviously, I'm kind of on my soapbox now. If we don't all find a kid in our family and get them into it, um, I mean, look at look at our attendance this evening. We're, we're all, I'm assuming we're all at least 40, 50 years old and older, so. Um, oh, I'm easily the youngest guy here, uh, easily. Right. You know, I mean, we need to get young people into it or it's, it's a hobby that will cease to exist and all these beautiful layouts that we've built will have no one to pass them on to. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Especially in the club layouts, you know. Kevin, it's not just the hobbies. Uh, there's an organization called the Professional Association of Professional Model Makers. And they recently did a contest. And they had 170 entrants in their contest. And they had not one single person from the United States, not one single student entered their contest from the United States. Yeah. You know, I met... 
when I was married uh, to my second wife, her grandfather lived in New Jersey and um, uh, right across the border from Philly. And um, across the street from his house was this guy that was a Canadian that had worked for General Motors. And her grandpa introduced me to the guy. We went over to his house and he just, you know, he had like a, a split level ranch kind of deal. And um, he goes, come on, let's go to the machine shop. And I'm like, machine shop? Where are you out in your garage? He goes, no, downstairs. And we went downstairs and then this guy that like in his, underneath the the upper level of the house this guy had like a bridgeport 2j mill and a like a six foot engine lathe and a bunch of other stuff in there i'm like how did you even get this down here and he said well you know i hired some guys and we took it apart and brought it downstairs i i i pity the people that bought that house because there was there was like six tons of machinery in the bottom of this guy's house but anyway i he was from saskatchewan and he had grown up on a farm out in the uh, you know, if anybody that's ever been to Saskatchewan, if you've been to Nebraska, Nebraska is, <laughs> is heavily populated in a uh, suburban area compared to Saskatchewan. <clears throat> I mean, you literally will drive for like five, six hours before you see another farmhouse in Saskatchewan. And he grew up on a farm like that. And there used to be from Fisher Body Works, there was a competition where you had to build I don't know how many of you guys are car guys or have ever seen it, but there was a Napoleonic coach that was the symbol, uh, the the uh, logo symbol for Fisher Body Works. If you've got like a muscle car or remember cars from the 60s or whatever, it was in the tread plate when you opened the door. And that is because Fisher Body Works, that's what they really did before they built car bodies for General Motors is they built coaches, stage coaches and private coaches and taxi coaches and that kind of thing. And so in the 20s and 30s, they had a contest where they would send you literally just directions and a list of materials that you needed and a place to order the materials from. Um, from, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the material for inside the coach or whatever. And you had to build this coach from scratch, the actual Napoleonic coach that Fisher Body Works had built for real. And, um, the, the level of detail on one of these things was insane. They were, they were probably like, uh, maybe one twelfth scale. So they were pretty big, but they weren't, you know, it wasn't like something you could ride on. And so he had to build this thing on a farm without a hobby shop near him. Um, and his story of building this coach was amazing. Like it had these four eagles on the corners of the coach, each corner of the coach. And you didn't get a mold. You got a print and he had to carve his own molds, his own negative molds. And then he uh, asked his father if he could cut up a tractor battery and get the lead out of it. And then he smelted the lead and poured these eagles. And um, you had to upholster the inside of this thing and you had to sit with a set of, of, of pliers and make chain. You had to make all the little chain links for the chains on the, the uh, yoke that went, or the, the hitch or whatever that went up to the horses. And you had to make the wheels, you had to make everything. And so then you would take this coach and go to a contest. And if you won the contest, you got a full ride to engineering college and a guaranteed job with Fitcher Body Works. And he failed. He came in second the first time. And instead of going, well, I'm done, he went home and built another one and won. And he retired from Fisher Body Works. And I've never forgotten that story. I, I was amazed that he, and he, his dad would, was, a, was being cheap and would not let it use electricity for life but he had to use an average farm chores and homework were done with a lantern like he'd set at the table with a kerosene lamp and had to do all this modeling like that and um kids today don't have that kind of challenge you know they all want to be video game experts or whatever and uh right. it's a shame well, for what it's worth stuff anymore for what it's worth video games the best dentists and microsurgeons are the ones who played the most video games yeah, I could see there's a relationship there. Sure, yeah, I could totally see that. And there's probably some robotics people that, you know, play video games or whatever. So there is a, there is a, 
there's a use for, a it, for but, it. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, though. I wish there were more that were playing with the building models like I did when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah. think that I think those people are probably the minority of of the video gamers. I mean, a lot of the video gamers that I know, they will completely just eat a sun. They don't do anything with their skills that they may have learned from video games. Um, I know the the um, the drone pilots in the military were are video gamers. The majority yeah. of them are video gamers. So there is a use there, but you know, I just see I see the majority of people that are video gamers. I, I don't want to poo-poo video games, but I think if there were less video games and more Lego, I see you, Mr. Funny Man. Um, well, it also depends on the type of video game. There is a um, well, basically, if you think about Minecraft, I mean, that's basically Legos in the virtual world almost. Right. Right. You know, uh, Kevin, an uh, interesting story. Um, I know a guy that uh, wanted to get a job with Disney. And so for his uh, resume, he built a 1930s era scene. And that's what he brought into Disney, and they, Disney hired him. Wow, that's cool. You know, when I was a kid and I saw Star Wars and, and then learned that the Death Star and a lot of the other things were all actually models that were scratch built. I, ha I would have to say that that, all right, go out in the other room, go out in the other room and play. Um, I would have to say that Star Wars and learning that the Death Star was scratch built really got me interested in scratch building. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I had always, I actually always lost it after becoming a uh, professional modeler for the movie industry. And um, years later, I learned that that was, it's a, they still have them, but it's it's virtually impossible. I mean, it's one of those things where you just kind of have to be in the right place at the right time to to, to uh, be accepted there. Right. When I, when I lived in California, I had an opportunity to work for the movie industry as a set builder. And uh, the problem with doing that is you get into the industry, but if you're the person that you're working with, the, the directors or something like this that you're working with, decide that they're no longer, they're like no longer part of that studio, you're out. <laughs> yeah right so I, didn't, I didn't do it but it would have been an interesting job to have you know there's some there's some really interesting facebook pages that are that revolve around scratch building models mm -hmm. there's a sci-fi one that i love looking at because the guys um they just kind of dream up spaceships to build mm -hmm. and they they build them out of the craziest stuff like they'll go to a store that has a lot of different soft drinks and they'll look for particular shapes soft drink bottles and soft drink caps and um like you know like yoohoo bottles and stuff like that and um different medicine bottles and bottles that had hand lotion and stuff in them and i mean they really take a lot of the basic shapes from those um types of things uh products and um a lot of the guys will post progress photos and the first time you see it, it looks like it was something from like, you know, Nerf instead of, or a super soaker instead of what's going to be a spaceship. And then they'll do progress photos when they start adding all the little pipes and the little detail lines out of styrene and whatnot. And then they paint it and weather it. And in the end, you're like, that's insanity. That, that looks like it should be in a legit science fiction movie like a Lucas film. And, and these guys, I asked one of them one time I messaged him, I'm like, what do you do with that stuff? He goes, I just got a shelf full of it. And sometimes somebody offered me money for it and I sell it. But, uh, you know, I just keep building this stuff. I mean, the imagination that those guys have is, is just crazy to be walking through a store and look at a pill bottle and go, yeah, it looks like it could be an engine or a fuselage for this spaceship I want to build, you know? And, um, another one that's really great is, uh, there's a, a, a Facebook page called Weathered Models. Mm -hmm. And the, if you guys are not on Weathered Models, you should be. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you like armor or aircraft or anything else. The Weathered Models really opened my interpretation of where modelers come from up. Um, one day I was looking at the page and this guy was from Iraq. And I'm like, Iraq. I never really, I guess I never really thought about 
some kid in Iraq building models, but they do. And the cool thing I thought about that was that uh, um, modeling is such a cool hobby because there are, there's no religion, there's no politics. Um, typically it's just art, artist, artistry and people being artisans and having imagination. And the cool thing is, is you can, uh, you can look at all these models and go through the conversation about the guy's post. And um, there, there's people from all over the world talking to this guy and it's like they're just neighbors, you know? And it's so refreshing in today's environment of everybody being at each other's throats because of all the various reasons people are at each other's throats anymore. I really like going on that page or going on the Stila Modeler page too, but I really like going on it because there's all these modelers are global and um, we all share modeling. And um, it actually inspired me to, so I have, um, I don't know if I can show it to you. I have my, my, my work area um, here is a, oh, now I lost it. No, we can still hear you. There's something going on with your camera, though. No, it, uh, I think our, our power went out for a minute for some reason. Uh, let me find out. Let me figure out how to get back to you here. A couple of interesting things, Kevin. Uh, you were talking about the Star Wars thing. You may not know this, but a lot of the little detail things all over the, uh, the Death Star and stuff like this are actually car parts. Yeah, they're the car, they're car and they're, they're uh, like ship yep um just so I, cool parts. you know one of the really cool things i gotta figure out how to get back to you guys um when i i actually saw an article about the modelers that built all that stuff um and we're i've got all these windows open and i'm not finding you guys anywhere in any of the windows so i'm not really sure how to get back I have a friend in Texas who, who does uh, modeling for the studios. Uh, it's, it's very, he says it's very interesting. He says like he built a whole street scene for this movie and they yeah. used like a, a little square piece of the whole thing that's all they used. <laughs> this whole thing that he built. <laughs> a lot of that goes on that they you build all this stuff for the studio and they use just a little any, any, any part of it. Uh, you know, the, the weathered modeler thing that you were talking about there, uh, I love weathering. It's it's something that just fascinates me. And uh, there one of the things I find interesting is I've learned more from uh, military modelers, which I have no interest in modeling, but from their techniques and stuff like that, I ever learned from the railroad guys. Well, you know, I had someone tell me that, that you need to, uh, I, I my camera still isn't there. Um, okay, so that's on. There we go. There you hey, go. we can see you again. Um, so, uh, so I had someone tell me that, and there's actually this young kid, and I, I was floored at how young this kid is, um, mm -hmm. called Panzermeister. On yes, YouTube. he's awesome. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> an ins it's crazy. He's like only like 22 or something. And if you listen to his yeah. really early videos, you can tell he's not gone through puberty. He's like, his voice is all crackly and sounds like a girl, you know. <laughs> and even then, his techniques were insane yeah. of how good of a, of a weathering modeler he was. Yeah. And um, I totally learned a bunch of stuff from watching his, uh, his weathering pages. And I use a lot of his techniques, honestly, on the steel mill stuff that I do. Because steel mills are, of course, crazy uh, heavy weathered. But, um, but anyway, as I was showing you guys my, my desk... I actually have like this big um, table too. And so I started this Facebook page called uh, Modelers Workspace Community. And so the point of the Facebook page was to help guys um, design their modeling workspace as well as organizing it and really bring everyone together that was from all the different types of modeling genres into one community because the one thing other than modeling that we all share is we all have a workspace. Right. Um, and so for like a year before I started that page, for like a year I was designing my workspace 
in my uh, head and I didn't have money to buy any of the stuff at the time. And, um, which I actually, for my whole life, I've always thought that that was advantageous to anyone that wanted to build something because how many guys do you hear that say, Oh, I, I wanted to build X and I went out and bought this stuff and it doesn't really work well for me or I hate it or it's uh, not a good design or whatever. And they end up either selling it or throwing out or whatever and buying more stuff. So not having the money sometimes is an advantage. And, I knew that because I was a steelman modeler, I needed a very large work area because a blast furnace, when done, including the stoves, is about three feet long. And so you can't be building that on an old roll top desk. You've got to have a big area. So, and I needed storage. I knew I wanted that. And so I uh, landed on, one day I was looking for some chairs in an office furniture place that's near my shop. And I saw these, they're called executive desks. And the, uh, the, I said, oh my God, those things are perfect. Well, they're like crazy money. And then as Facebook Marketplace and uh, this app called Let Go came along, I started looking on there and what I discovered is there's, there's like an army of, of I'm going to have a home business people that run out and buy executive desks and then uh, you know, six months or a year later, their business didn't do what they thought it was going to do. And the desk ends up because it's a monstrosity ends up on one of these, you know, places for a couple hundred bucks. So, um, I, I, I looked and looked and looked because there's a lot of different configurations. And what the one thing that I, I absolutely wanted in mind was this feature. They're called in and out boxes because I wanted, uh, I have all my sandpaper in this one, and this one has my sheet, uh, brick sheet and, and corrugated siding and whatnot, and I keep my, uh, um, you know, my set of exactos up here. I, I actually bought this, I had a couple guys laugh at me, and I was like, well, I had that when I was a kid, so I bought another one, you know. And a uh, files, and I bought, I, I got some really nice uh, uh, stare at pin vices, because I hate cheapy pin vices, they, they suck. And then I've got another one that I can't quite show you here that's got all of my like flat stock styrene. And then, you know, up here I've got my uh, overstock of uh, Titchy Train stuff that I use for building and some other, um, some other product up there. Most of my Titchy Train stuff is in there. And this one is all like my overflow paints. And I really wanted... I really wanted one with this back panel because I wanted to use these paint organizers that you can hang because otherwise this is just wasted space. And these paint organizers you can hang is fantastic. And I put up a magnetic strip down here to hold, you know, scissors and all that kind of garbage. And then I got the tiered ones for my oil paints and my ink and some uh, my weathering powders and whatnot. And uh, I have a cupboard over here that's got like my, my um, some organizing trays and I keep my drill press, my Dremel drill press in there and my soldering iron and whatnot. And underneath, there's these drawers here that I keep uh, more stuff in. And I've, I've actually, I searched and searched and searched for a way to keep my styrene, um, my styrene organized. And... Um, one day it dawned on me that my ex and I were kind of winos and we got these bags all the time and they happen to be the same length as an evergreen, an evergreen packet. <laughs> so I just started labeling them. You know, this is, this is hand railings, right? So it's got just the styrene in it that I use for hand railings. Well, I've got one, I keep them currently in a wastebasket. Um, and I've got one that's like a uh, small rod and tube and then larger rod and tube and one that's C-channel and one that's, I mean, as a steel mill model, are using a lot of structural shapes. So there's tons of structural shapes in there. And um, what I'm actually going to do is have a friend of mine rebuild part of this and move this cabinet down and add another cabinet up here with another, uh, another um, in and out box. And he's going to take the two bottom drawers in the, 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 the uh, filing cabinet area and he's going to make them one big drawer and I'm going to put all my styrene in there. So that'll be stored away as well. And, um, 
and then what you guys are watching me from this this desk is like a u shape so i've got my big area over here that i keep my um actually have a, a k and k force over here that I, a die cutter that i use um but it allowed me to get you know a three uh a, a um 24 by uh i think it's uh 24 by 18 cutting mat and I can build blast furnaces and stuff on here, and it's it's plenty of space. And then the little end section of the U, the bottom of the U, if you will, is my design area. So that's where I have this. Uh, you guys are watching me on an old uh, Apple Cinema screen that I got on for like a couple hundred bucks on uh, Let Go. And um, uh, so I've got like this painting area, and I've got my modeling area and my design area. And I have to tell you, it's it's a fantastic workspace. Um, the, the big addition that I made to it was I was watching, a, a, a clinic from the NMRA convention that talked about, uh, it was, this guy was an, an, uh, an, and I'm not good with doctor terms. He's an eye surgeon. Um, so his clinic was all about light and vision for the model, fantastic clinic that's on video um, he talks about how as we age our eyes require more and more Kelvin and more and more lumens um, as well as your tears change chemistry as you age and so uh, listening to all this it made me go oh my lighting is horrible in here so I went and bought LED lights that are, are uh, in the daylight spectrum and I've discovered that with LED lights that are, that are the way they build them, the more lumens you have, meaning how bright they are, the less Kelvin they'll have, which is the daylight spectrum. And so knowing a little bit about lighting, over my modeling desk where I don't necessarily need like daylight Kelvin ratings, I bought uh, 5,800 lumen and I think they're, um, 47 or 4,800 Kelvins, which is just on the edge of daylight, uh, to mount up high over my hobby, over my modeling area. And, and you have to make sure that your lighting, you have lighting that's in front of you and lighting that's behind you, because that way you don't get any shadowing when you're modeling. You're illuminated from, from both sides, so your hands don't make shadows and your head doesn't make shadows and you're not you're able to see what you're working on as well as behind what you're working on and then because I didn't have a lot of elevation over here um, there are two lights mounted under here and these are uh, uh, 5800 Kelvin lights but they're only like 3400 lumens so they're not really bright but they're they're, they're literally sunny day in Arizona lumen uh, Kelvins and you need more light like that because you're going to see the actual color of something that you're painting, the actual color of the, the paint, but also you're going to be able to see very well for what you're, you're painting. And then, um, well, I did with him. Uh, he talked about getting eye drops for, uh, putting an eye drop in, um, before you start modeling and to get ones at the uh, pharmacy that don't have any preservatives in them because the preservatives will actually dry your eyes out. And the, uh, um, the non-preservative based ones last a longer. And because as you get older, you, your chemistry may change, but you also don't blink as much, which lubricates your eye. And, um, and I, he also talked about don't put your head down and look at what you're modeling, keep your head level and use your eyes because if you're, if you're, modeling in front of your face you're only using two muscles to focus your eyes and if you're looking down you're actually using four muscles and your eyes won't fatigue as fast and uh if you guys are anything like i am when i sit down to model i'm usually sitting here for like four hours i get up and can't walk because my legs are shot from sitting here but uh, he also talked about going to your optometrist and telling them if you wear glasses, look, I'm a modeler and I need glasses for modeling and I need the focus range to be uh, um, eight to uh, 14 inches. And he said, that's kind of the average range that you're going to 
actually model at. And um, uh, I actually mentioned that to my optometrist, and she goes, God, I never thought about that. That's very true. I have lots of crafts people that comes in, come in here, and I never think to offer to them that I could make you, rather than reading glasses, I could make you glasses to do your hobby with. So I've, I, I really kind of added all those features into my uh, hobby uh, desk. And I have to tell you, doing the since I've started the Modelers Workspace community on Facebook, I've actually gotten some more, um, some more uh, insight into things that I could do to make my uh, modeling area better. And um, uh, I think it's probably helped a lot of guys too. I think we, <clears throat> I haven't looked on there in a while <clears throat> at our membership, but I know it was up around almost 2000 people. And um, the other great thing about, the, the, the Facebook page is guys will post up a picture of their modeling area that looks like a bomb went off in it. And they'll, they'll make a comment about, you know, oh, you know, I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about organizing this and cleaning it up, but I haven't really gotten around to it. And it's funny because a lot of guys from the, 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 the Facebook page will jump on there and say, well, when are you going to get to it? You know, so it's kind of like peer pressure. And it, it's actually funny to think about it, but a lot of people on the page have posted pictures maybe a week or two later of their desk and their work area like completely cleaned up and organized. So if the page is good for nothing other than that, it, I think it's fantastic because you work better when, you're, when your work area is organized. Um, you know, I belonged, to a run, I belonged to a round robin group years ago in California and I always was glad when I was the host that they had to clean my workbench. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like I made a promise to myself that I actually haven't kept because I recently became about four, uh, I don't know, it's, it's August, about five months ago, I became a single dad. And I have not actually sat and modeled anything in a while because I'm running my business and, you know, taking care of my little guy. I used to model for predominantly in the evening right. and uh, now I spend my evenings with him. But um, I made myself a promise when I built this that I would clean it every Sunday. And, and I was keeping up with that really well. I haven't, because I haven't sat here, I haven't cleaned it in a while. But uh, that, that sounds like a good plan, really. Clean it every <laughs> Yeah, week. I just gave myself a, uh, I, I always, one of my, one of my um, rules is, is if I'm sitting here and I know I can model till, say, 10 p.m., um, at 9.50, I have to stop modeling and I have to put my tools away and put my paints back in the rack and my glue back in its rack and um, any extra pieces, I've got to put those in my organizers or whatever. I have to take like 10 minutes and put everything away. And I have to tell you, it, 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 it works very well doing that. And the other thing that I did too was I grab one of these lists. So I make up these lists, right? And these lists are projects that I have. So I know you guys are probably all angels and don't have a hobby room with 9,000 kits and unfinished projects in them. Um, <laughs> but uh, I am not like that. And it can be overwhelming and because you think about it, you're like, God, I've got all these engines I need to repair and these cars to put together and these other cars to car knock and I've got this building kit to put together and then I got to paint it weather and that's going to take forever and I've got to put lighting over here or whatever. And so I thought, well, I'm going to make up lists with about 10 items on them and I'm going to make a rule that I have to do the items either on the list or in order. Uh, originally, I was doing it in order and, and it just didn't work because I made sure that I put items on the list that I know would take three or four hours to do. And I had items on the list that I can do in maybe 35, 45 minutes, something like that. And I found that better to mix the list up like that because obviously eventually you're going to run out of the 30, 30 to 45 minute projects and you're going to have to do the four hour project. But I cannot go on to the next list until every box is checked on the list that I have. <laughs> And it has made me complete things. Um, I have like a hundred ore cars that I'm decaling. They all get decaled for, for my road. And it takes me about, about 20 minutes to decal an ore car. And um, uh, I, I wasn't doing it. 
because I have a hundred ore cars to do. And so I blocked it into three car sets because I can do three cars in roughly an hour. So I can sit down in an evening and I can decal three ore cars. And then, um, you know, the next evening I can weather them and then I can put the trucks and everything on and I can take them over to the train club and leave them. And, um, and I've been doing it, you know, uh, uh, and I, and I don't have just ore cars in the list. I don't know if you saw the list. I got to put a decoder in an SD 45 dash two. I got to decal some ore cars. I have to decal a hundred ton hopper. Um, I have to decal some Coke hoppers. I've got to finish an SD 40 dash two. I started and I got to finish my Erie calcium carbide gondola. Um, it, it really works. And I put that out on the modelers workspace community and a bunch of guys went, Oh my God, that's a great idea. And you know, not all of us are organizers. So, uh, I think it may have helped guys there too. Um, and I've seen guys on there, you know, post pictures of the list and go, look, I'm getting these projects done and it makes it, it compartmentalizes how many projects you have to do. So it, it, it makes it a little less mind boggling about how you're going to complete all this stuff. I have I have the my my kits like one shelf is nothing that started next shelf the things are partly built and stuff like this so I know I have to work from the partly built shelf or whatever and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing that, that you mentioned about the bags uh, a few years ago I was trying to figure out how to organize my my woods collection and my uh, my strip wood collection and my styrene strips collection and what I use is a, a wine box. Mm -hmm. Where all the yep. bottles go, yep. and then, you know, each one like the ten thousand here, the twenty fifteen, and so on. So it works out great for organizing that kind of stuff. You know, uh, like, a guy, a guy had suggested these tubes. He made a rack of tubes um, mm -hmm. for his styrene out of like PVC tubing, and mm -hmm. I looked at that for a long time. Actually, one of the other guys that manufactures stuff, this guy named Brandon Way. Um, he showed me his little cart that he had built and it had all these vertical, it was like a wine box, but it was made out of wood and it was on casters. And the thing I didn't like about it was, you know, in, in this bag, because I can take it out, I don't know where my camera is, because I can take this out of the thing and I can get my hand in it, I can have um, sections of I-beam in the bottom of one of these that are four inches long. They're too big to go in my, my my organizer boxes and they're too small to go back in the package you know right and for me these work better because for one if i if i accidentally tear one of these or they wore out, wear out or whatever uh, all i'm out is a magic marker and another wine bag out of my stash because i bring enough wine bags home you know mm -hmm. I, i'm not a drunk but I, I probably get four of these bags a month maybe or or three a month and I just save them. And honestly, they know me at the grocery store enough. I said, hey, could I have a sheaf of those? They'd probably just, you know, get out a lot of them and give them to me. But these are cheap. I, they would normally just go in the trash. And they, I was shocked when I put one of the evergreen styrene things in it. And I'm like, oh my God, it's the same length. <laughs> but, uh, and I like that I can divide it up and I can physically take it out. Like if I have to go to the, a lot of my stuff, I have to go to the train club. Like when I finish the downcomer, the, the Coke works, I have to like build parts of that in place. So I have to make up like a box to take with me of tools and glue and, and whatever. And, uh, and I can just grab the bags. So I need some I-beam and I need some round tube and I can just grab it and take it with me. And, uh, and it works out really well. Another thing that I got too was, uh, um, like guys had thought about was, you know, they were having something that's dead flat and being in my industry, we use what's called a surface plate and there are cast iron surface plates and there are granite surface plates and you know, finding they're huge and they're really heavy. Um, but the granite is flat. So I was driving to work one day and there's a shop that does countertops, um, by my shop. And I thought, Oh, wait a minute. They have to cut a hole in the granite for these underhung sinks. I wonder what they do with the plug out of the hole. Really? So I walked in there and I'm like, hey, uh, do you guys keep those plugs? And they were like, well, we usually throw them out. And I'm like, well, do you have one that's about so big? And, and so I have one that I got for free and it's flat and it's granite and it's about 
half an inch thick. And it's, it's great because nothing sticks to it. If the super glue dries on it, it's like a razor blade and scrape it off, you know, mm. and a razor blade isn't going to damage it. And um, so I use that for like gluing things together that I want to make sure are perfectly flat. But you don't cut stick, on a razor. Let them dry and you just take a razor blade and pop the thing loose. You I'm don't sorry. actually cut on it, do you? No, I have a cutting mat. Um, there's this uh, cutting mat brand called Crafty World that you can buy on Amazon. And I did a ton of research before I bought mine. They have one like mine that's huge. It's 24 by 36, or I mean 18 by 24 is the biggest one they make. Um, it's self-healing like for real. And, uh, and they aren't, they're expensive, but they're not crazy money. And they make ones all the way down to like a little, you know, a little uh, like six by 10 guy. Um, and they are by far and away, they're the best brand cutting mat you can buy. Hmm. Um, I, I have looked at a bunch of different ones. I did, I literally did a bunch of research on what would kind of be the best one. And between looking, my sister's a, a quilter. I talked to her about it. Um, I went, you know, and talked to people at the Hobby Lobby and I uh, did a little research online. I said, hey, what's a good craft mat to have? And I didn't necessarily pay attention just to the modelers. I wanted to hear from other people. Uh, matter of fact, my one wi friend's wife is a uh, scrapbooker and she has one. And she said, oh yeah, this is the one that I use because in the craft booking world, it's the one that your knives last the longest and the craft mat really does self heal and, the, and they last the longest. So it's really good money. What'd you uh, say the name of that was? was? Crafty World. Um, I don't know if I can. Thanks. They, they have them on, on Amazon. I got mine on Amazon. Um, it's Crafty with a Y, Crafty World. Um, they're, they're green. They're the typical green. They're double sided too. So when the scale wears out on one side, you can flip it, you know. Yeah, because I have mean, very spill stuff on mine and <laughs> wipe off the scale. <laughs> yeah, the ink comes off, right? I do these little I do these little stands. Mm -hmm. I'm like a 50 science fiction nerd, so I drew these up and I sell these on my site. <laughs> I've got one for this this one is for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And I've got one that's uh, specifically for the uh, for plastic weld. Um, and uh, um, it's funny because I've had guys go, oh, that looks like it would tip over. Well, they, they don't, they don't. They, they may look like they could, but they don't tip over because the bottle doesn't actually sit on the table. It sits in this little stand. So the weight is all out here. And um, I got tired of tipping my glue over. I did it once and I'm like, okay, I have a 3D printer. I'm not gonna do that again. And then I had guys, when I put them online, I had guys go, oh, you just take a two by four and drill a hole in it. Well, yeah, but the two by four doesn't look like it's from, you know, Forbidden Planet. So <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a guy send me a picture of the ones that he bought and he had, he took and painted them with that chrome paint that dries and it looks really like chrome. And they were, I was like, wow, that looks really cool. <laughs> cool. Devin, let me ask you a question. You're, yeah. the, you're, you're the first modeler that, uh, that I've ever heard talk about imagination and the importance of imagination. Uh, it, is that what I call the artistic part of modeling or is imagination in your mind different? No, I would say it's the artistic part, but you know, as a steel mill modeler, so steel mill modelers are not unique in model railroading other than the scale of what we're building, um, but uh, there, there are probably the least, uh, the, the refinery guys are probably the same way. There's probably the, the, the least number of support uh, manufacturers for what we do. So if you want a specialized car, um, you're building it. You know, and you may not get plans. You may only have photographs. So you have to know how to scale the, the car or whatever. But, um, you know, Dean Freetag is kind of regarded as the grandfather of, uh, of SEMA modeling. He used to say that uh, it doesn't have to be prototype. It has to look real. So what he meant was, you know, most people looking at whatever you've built um, aren't going to be able to critique what you built and say, hey, that's not right. 
um, as long as it's very convincing. And so you run pipes everywhere and people are like, oh, it looks fantastic. Well, you can't do that if you don't have any imagination. And uh, I, I, think, I think the scratch builders in model railroading, but certainly the steel mill modelers have to, <laughs> hi buddy, um, they have to have the imagination to do it. And you know, for my job, I build high-end race cars. Um, without imagination, you're not building a race car because you have to put a device somewhere you can't just go in a catalog and buy a bracket. You have to imagine how it's going to go there. Is it going to be maintainable? Can you get it out uh, to maintain it? If it has to be repaired, is it going to be near something hot that's going to burn it or boil the liquid that's inside of it or whatever? Um, and I think without imagination, you can't do any of that. Um, I, 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 I understand exactly what you're saying. I think every scratch builder uh, goes through the process. You know, I can't yeah. tell you how many nights I've gone to bed with with a problem on my mind uh, of yeah. a model I'm trying to build and uh, try to come up with a solution uh, that I think I can that I think I can go back to the shop in the morning and, and make work. And you know, that's that's one of the great things about it too is if you come up with a solution and try to solve it right away, or if you come up with a problem and you try to solve it right away, that is. It's to let it sit and just stare at it every time you walk by it, or maybe even completely ignore it, and, and it just catches your eye when you're walking by it or whatever. And eventually, it will all come into clarity uh, exactly what you have to do to, um, you know, to, to 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 solve the problem. Um, I've got this building sitting back here. I don't know if I can get it out and show it to you. Um, that I have built for our club. And uh, many of you may recognize this building as the Walder's uh, meatpacking plant. And it was sitting upon part of our lab, just like a standing building, someone had donated it. And, uh, and I, I had never seen it before, I just never paid attention to it. And I asked uh, the guy that was modeling the area, I said, so what's this supposed to be? And he goes, oh, it's a meatpacking plant from Walder's. And I said, a meat packing plant. I've been near meat packing plants. There ain't no four story meat packing plants. You know, they bring the cows in one end uh, and it's, it's uh, pretty much usually on a level. It's level because you're bringing cows in one end and slaughtering them. And then there's a trolley that goes through the building and they go down to where they're cutting and butchering the meat up and whatever. And uh, you know, they're not going to take it up four stories to do something with it. And, um, and there were no windows around the bottom. And I'm like, that looks more like a boiler house to me than a meat packing plant. Because um, anybody that lives in an industrial area and has driven through an old industrial area sees a building that's got windows that are two, three stories, you know, three, four stories up on the building. I mean, typically that building has probably not got floors in it. It's got giant boilers in it. Um, because in the old days, that's how they illuminated the inside of the building during the day was with windows. And so uh, um, I said, hey, can I have that? Uh, he was building this other plant. And I said, what you need is a boiler house at that plant. He's building a cereal plant. I said, you got to have steam, man. You got to have steam to heat up the molasses when it comes in the cars and get it out of the cars and uh, steam to heat the, the plant. And for numerous other, you know, things that the plant needs, make it make their own electricity. So I brought it home and I, I use this Walder's meat packing plant and I built these forced draft ducks that I found uh, photos of that are at this place called Crosscut, uh, Arizona. Gunner, go up front. Thank you. Uh, that just looked cool. So I, I designed them so that they would, you know, you could glue them in place, the draft ducks, you could glue in place of windows on the end of the building or on the side because the windows are all the same. And then I, I wanted it to be coal fired. So this is actually the a crusher from one of the Walder's Coke batteries that's turned upside down. When I saw, I saw pictures of one similar and uh, I built a bucket, I, I built a bucket elevator and I actually drew up and printed the top, the return for the bucket elevator where the chute is and you build, you build the bottom, the, the, the elevator itself you build out of strip styrene and I designed it so it uses stock sizes from Evergreen so you're not having to cut you know, 12 inch long or however long you build your bucket elevator, you're not having to cut those things and try to make them square. You just go buy it and 
you know, cut it to length. And um, uh, I've had guys look at it and they're like, wow, did you scratch build that? I'm like, well, I scratch built part of it. It's, it's a Walder's meatpacking plant. Oh yeah. They don't look like meatpacking plants. They look like a boiler house. You know, so I always say that good, I'm a, in civilian world, it's, it's called fabricating. And I always say a good fabricator is a lazy fabricator because if you don't need to build a tank or a reservoir or lines or a fitting or something like that, why are you going to spend money and charge the customer money to build that stuff when you can just buy it and just make the thing that everything attaches to? And um, uh, I think boiler houses are cool. You don't have to have, there's one, actually the one that inspired me with this one is at a prison uh, in Sanye, New York. Uh, and it's actually not got a bunker. It's got a uh, coal bridge that goes off the, 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 the um, boiler house is built down a hill and the railroad is up in the top of the hill. So they just built a coal trestle off one side of it and the railroad in the old days would just back hoppers out onto the coal trestle and op open the, the chutes and the coal would you know, drop into the, into the bunker for the, uh, um, for the powerhouse. But, uh, I thought it would be a cool, you know, model for almost anybody's layout, um, with kind of minimal, I mean, you could have it gas fired or do a coal trestle or whatever you wanted to do with it. Um, but you got to have imagination to do that kind of stuff. I never look at buildings as what they sell them for. I always look at buildings as parts for something I want to build. And I'm, I'm just being lazy. Why would I build wall sections when I don't have to? There's a kid out there somewhere that has wall sections that I need. I, 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 I find that interesting too because I, I have the same kind of philosophy. When I go look at somebody's layout, I don't want to see this, oh, that's a so-and-so kit and that's a so-and-so kit. <laughs> yeah, you don't want it to look like it fell out of the Waller's catalog, right? Well, exactly. I the whole layout. Like, what is yeah, what is that? Oh, that's what I was a meat pegging plant. Really? Wow. You know? Yeah. Type of, and so I, I have that same kind of philosophy. I, I, don't, I don't build anything that's a structure uh, unless it's an exact prototype uh, that I don't modify it in some way so it doesn't look like what it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, right. The other thing I, did, I, I wanted to, you know, being from the, from the east, most of the steel mills are old. And so, that, like, out here, the steel mills, a lot of the buildings are corrugated sheet. And out east, most of the buildings in the older mills are brick because, you know, in the 20s, um, there were lots of Irishmen and Polish uh, people, uh, Polish men, and labor was cheap and so was brick. So they built everything out of brick and it, and it couldn't catch fire, you know. And um, so you see a lot of guys do brick buildings. You can buy brick sheet. Um, but the thing I, I really don't like is that they always – they don't really look at what color the brick is in that area um, because brick is brick always ends up being the color of the clay where they get it from, you know? Right. And, um, and the thing that they don't add is mortar. And um, so I started researching mortar and how to do mortar and there's all these washes and whatever. And um, I just was not able to master any of them. And I thought all of them sucked. I thought they took too long to do and they didn't look right. And then I discovered uh, this, uh, this Robert's brick mortar. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he's kind of an older guy. He's up in Milwaukee because if you order from him, it, it takes a little bit to get this stuff from him. But, uh, but it's really easy to use. And it, I'm telling you, I'm not some kind of like, you know, Michelangelo. If I can use it, anybody could use it. <laughs> and um, I experimented with different, he tells you to use an ink wash to, color the mortar unless you just want a newly built building and it's white um, and he actually had said that you could just use black India ink and it would it would just kind of gray it a little bit and I found that that was actually a little too dark and so I got white ink and would mix and I have to tell you if you have a half a cup of white ink and you want it to be just a little bit gray you need like the smallest drop of black you can possibly imagine. I'm not sure why India ink is such a, 
crazy good dye, but the first time I did it, I thought, oh, I'll go 50-50 and I'll get like a nice dark gray. Yeah, no, I got black. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I, when I mix gray, it's like, literally it's like 20 parts white to one tiny drop of black and it'll make a nice gray. Um, but it's, yeah, so just be careful with that. I've actually got gray ink too. I haven't really tried it. You know, the guy at the art store was like, why do you want gray ink? I'm like, well, I want to, you know, I, 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 he says, you can just mix black and white. I'm like, okay, so I'm not an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I want to buy something ready made so I don't screw it up. And, um, yeah, so anyway, I'm blinding you guys with my, with my bald forehead. There, that's a little better. Um, but anyway, um, so I, I probably run my mouth a lot. I don't know if I gave you guys any kind of insight on, on, uh, you know, modeling. Great stuff. You definitely, you definitely did. Great stuff. Excellent. Check out, um, not because it's something in my eyelash there. Um, check out, you guys should check out, uh, the, um, modelers workspace community page. And I'm not just like, you know, pimping it cause it's my page. I really do think that there is a lot we can all learn from everyone that's a modeler, no matter the genre. What, what is it called again? Modelers Workspace Community. Oh, it's kind of a weird name, but you know, it's what I thought of at the time. That's Facebook? Yeah, it's on Facebook. And definitely give weathered models a look. Uh, yeah, that's, that's excellent. And, and Panzermeister. Panzermeister, it doesn't matter that he's doing German tanks. Uh, he's actually a model rarer too, I found that out. Um, but his, his weathering techniques, anyone can do his weathering techniques. If you do them like he does in the video and you use the product to start with, you use the product that he uses and do it like he does it, you will get results just like he is teaching in the video. And, uh, Another good one is scale uh, war machines. What's that? Another good one is scale war machines on YouTube. Oh yeah, okay. I'll I'll check out that check that out. Scale war machines. Okay. I learned that's where I learned about the salt technique and the uh, oh. gray stuff like this is from him. Yeah, I use Panzermeister uses the Aquanet or not Aquanet. Um, no, it's another one that I Trey, think, I remember uh, Trey, he, Trey 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 Samay. Trey Samay. Trey Samay. Yeah. And I actually tried that, and exactly like it works for him is is how it works. If you follow his technique, it works exactly like he shows it in the video. Kevin, what's the what's the sci-fi uh, Facebook page? Um, it's like sci scratch sci-fi scratch builders or something like that. Hold on a sec, let me look it up here. Um, my son's getting a little stir crazy because then. He's by himself for like an hour, so. Um, sci-fi, it's called Sci-Fi and Fantasy Model Builders Guild. Okay. Model Builders Group, sorry. Sci-Fi and Fantasy. You know, you guys were talking about young people in the hobby. Um, they may not be doing trains, but interesting things that the guys that do the like Dungeons and Dragons type games and uh -huh. stuff like this are yeah. some pretty amazing modelers that, that build their, their castle scenes and all this stuff like this. So there are guys that are young people that are doing modeling. It's just not what we, we model. Yeah. And, 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 and you kind of have to go global, you know, I mean, that's where a lot yeah. of that, I think in, I think especially in Japan and Germany, the German mm -hmm. steel mill modelers, uh, are in a league all by themselves. There's this guy uh, over there. If you go on um, Facebook and look up uh, Groob Careless Miner, um, it's spelled. Uh, are you now you're a SWAT guy? All right, that's cool. No, uh, actually, I'm I'm Snoopy catching. Oh, the red you're Baron. Snoopy catching the Red Baron. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, so it's Groob is G R U B E, and Carolus is like the name Carol with U S on the end of it, and then Magnus like, uh, like the Roman the Roman guy Magnus. Um, so this guy, he, I know him. Um, 
this guy is modeling an actual uh, um, coal mine and, and mill that, that's in Germany. It's in northern Germany. It's not there anymore. And like the whole thing, the whole town. Like he, he has scratch built every house in town. And he'll post up photos. The first time I saw it was I saw the Coke battery. There's a Coke battery there. And I saw the Coke battery and I was like, wow, that's a really good color. But, oh, wait, that's not a photo. That's a model. And I was blown away at how real it was. And then later he posted up this scene looking down a street. And it was a split screen photo looking down a street uh, that kind of curved or had like a, like a lazy, like a Studebaker S turn in it. And all the houses and everything on it. And next to it, was the models of that that he had built. And you could almost not tell the difference between the real photo of the town and the uh, model on his layout of all these houses. I mean, it's almost like he went to all the houses or went down to the city hall and got the plans for the houses and built them or whatever. I mean, he's like an insanely good modeler. There's photos from inside the machine shop on his layout, the little machine shop for the, 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 the Coke works. And uh, you'd be hard pressed if there weren't people in the in the photo, little HO scale people. You'd be hard pressed to tell that it was not a photo of the actual machine shop. And, and he's just an insanely good modeler. And all the German guys seem to be like that. They're all just like crazy good modelers. I don't. I, don't, I guess it's because they're, you know, the Germans. There's a guy in California named Chuck Doan that uh, does amazing modeling like that too. That you can't. Matter of fact, if you go on Pin Pin Interest. Uh, they'll show like country stores uh, and then I'll show this one and it's actually one of Chuck's models but looks like a real store so I think it's, it's a real store. <laughs> yeah there's a guy in um, I think he's in Brazil on uh, he might be on Modeler's Guild I think he's on Modeler's Guild and he does these like uh, 124 scale city scenes of like uh, convenience stores or uh, a pizza shop or whatever. And, and there'll be like four or five cars along, parked along the street. And the first time I saw them, I thought it was a prototype photo from like the 50s. It was actually one of his models. Because uh, every once in a while on, um, on there, they'll have like uh, Hands On Friday, I think it's called, where you're supposed to post a photo of what you've built with your hand in the image. Oh. or your finger pointing at something in the image or whatever. So he did that once and I'm like, oh my God. I mean, he builds, he builds all the like trash cans and the dumpsters and there's like litter on the sidewalk and all that. And uh, um, it, it's insane how awesome it is. Kevin, I can't thank you enough for tonight. It's, uh, it's really been enlightening and, and you really uh, brought a lot of things to the table that frankly I've never thought about before. Oh, and I really do appreciate it and, and can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us. Yeah, no problem. That's the great thing about our hobby is uh, as long as everybody's sharing and I, I kind of look at the Facebook groups as that we all get to share information and a lot of, I, I totally would not be the modeler I am right now without uh, the groups that I've and, and the guys that I've met on Facebook and all the information sharing. And uh, I mean, I think we're in a kind of a golden age for what we do because of this kind of social media. Where, where I get to meet all you guys that I normally would probably never see. I see there's guys from Oregon and Michigan and California and uh, all over the place. And um, uh, I, think, I think that's a, really a boon for those of us that are willing to use it and, and be able to share things with each other because the information sharing and the idea sharing makes all of us better modelers. Totally agree. This, and this bunch right here is all over the country. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Guys in California, I'm in Carolina, you know, yep. Jim in Florida, and, and Dylan's in Massachusetts. So, I mean, we're all over the place. Yeah, it's very cool. Yep. Kevin, all I got right. a question for you. Yeah. What inks are you using? I use Higgins. Okay. Uh, I don't know why I use Higgins. I like the packaging, so I guess I got caught up in marketing. Um, <laughs> I do have uh, this FW brand. Um, I haven't used it yet at all. Uh, we had an art store go out of business and I bought some of it 
because it was really cheap and I'm a cheap ass. Um, but I really like the Higgins ink. I have used it and I really do like it. I, this was recommended by a guy at the art store. He's like, oh yeah, it's like top of the line ink. Yeah, it mix it with alcohol to make a wash out of it. Yeah, yeah. Something I ran into is uh, Golden Paints and mm -hmm. I found it at Dick Blick's and they have what they call a high flow acrylics. Oh. And they really actually classify it as an ink, not oh, a paint wow. because of the size of the, um, oh, what the, particles in it and they have a lot of the base primary colors and they do have a couple of different grays oh okay and you can mix it with almost like an airbrush thinner which is usually about half distilled water and half um, isopropyl alcohol yeah I'm I'm actually kind of still in the um, I'm still in the, the floquil age uh, I've tried airbrushing acrylics and I need to watch a lot more videos because I watched the Panzermeister kid do it and he makes it look like you're spraying with Floquil and he never has problems and the few times I've tried it all it does is gum up the end of my airbrush so no, I, I have a lot I have a lot to learn about acrylic paint. This high, high flow acrylics does spray real well oh okay but I did end up with a yellow which had some water in it so as I'm spraying, I'm getting orange peel. Oh no! Mm -hmm. And yeah. but they have colors you can mix. I was trying to go for a like a Denver and Rio Grande gold. Mm -hmm. Had the color spot on, but the yellow had little bits of water. As I'm trying to spray a model, I'm getting oh, that's not a good result. Yeah, I I am one of those guys that I I literally I I'm progressive about. Um, the lighting and the uh, methodologies of modern weathering and all these, uh, you know, brushes and all this other stuff. And um, I even bought an Awada airbrush and stopped using my Apache. And uh, and the one the one and only thing that I have dug my heels in with is the paint, is the Floquil paint. And I I'm one of the idiots that goes on eBay and I'll buy. Uh, you know, I got some, um, I got this jar of uh, Brunswick green, which is like gold uh, for anybody that's a, an Eastern or a Pennsylvania Railroad modeler. Uh, my private road, uh, my private road uses Brunswick green. Thanks, buddy. Um, and it's really hard to get it and I'll pay $20 for a bottle of it. You know what it used to be like, what did it used to be like about two fifty a bottle or something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. 349 yeah. Yeah. My, um, my road, um, my road, my diesel road colors, this is one of my, my, uh, I don't know if I can okay. get this is one of my diesels, uh, and my, so my road, my private road, um, I'm one of those guys that got tired of people telling me that I didn't have the right grab irons or whatever on a particular engine, so, you know, now I have my own, and I'm the master of my own world. Exactly. And, and in my yeah. world, my railroad is a subsidiary of the Pensy. We Our job is hauling coal for the um, steel mills over the Alleghenies to uh, uh, Lackawanna and to the mills in Ohio. And Kevin? Uh, Kevin? Yeah. You, you might check the Hold narrow on. gauge model company. What's that? Uh, the narrow gauge model company. Yeah, a guy named Kevin runs it. You might be able to remember his name. Uh, Kevin, um, um, I can actually email you Kevin's email. He does keep yeah, a lot yeah, of local yeah, he's, around. He's, he's, it's a whole lot cheaper than twenty dollars a bottle. I, I actually really like um, this True Color. Mm -hmm. um, this stuff airbrushes great, and the one thing that it's a little bit spendy, but the thing that I have discovered is that you can thin the ever loving hell out of it, and it will cover great. I mean, I typically, I spray, like I sprayed about 30 of these poppers, um, maybe more than that, out of one jar, plus some cabooses, about three cabooses and uh, some box, some box cars out of one, out of one of these, one of these jars. And I, I just kept, I like, I probably thinned it like 70%. And it, was, it wasn't multiple coats to cover the model. 
that's pretty much what I use exclusively for you know, for engines and cars now because the, the flow <laughs> quote is hard to get. And the problem with it is if you pray something now with it because you have it and you have to do a repair or something down the road and, and you don't have it, then the nice thing about the true color is that you can get it. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, and, I picked the, out a color. The color that I use for um, brick, uh, let me see if I can find it. It's a, actually a German color. Uh, it's a German model master color, which they've now discontinued called Root uh, Rock Brown, R-A-L. It was like a German, World War II German camouflage color. And when they discontinued it, I literally bought all of it in Chicago. I, I went to hobby shops I didn't even know existed and I bought all of it. So I have like, I must have like 20 jars of it because I was afraid of that because it's the color, that color brown matches the brick that I remember from where I'm from in Western New York. And uh, I was afraid it was gonna do the same thing that testers did with, you know, with, with the Floquil. They got rid of it and they, you know, now anybody that has it has gold. I haven't tried the uh, Brunswick Green from from True Color yet. I've heard that it's like a, a better match even than the Floquil stuff. But, All right, but uh, the layout paints are really good paints too. They're not railroad colors, but they're really good paints. Yeah, yeah. And I like the True Color stuff because it's uh, it's a solvent based paint, so it's it, it it does spray a lot like Floquil. It doesn't have the same smell though. I'll go over to the train club and all the old guys will be sitting in the train room and I'll open a jar of Floquil and they'll be like, hey, who's got Floquil in here? You know? <laughs> you know, that, that, that jar of Diosol that costs, what, eight bucks for a little jar like that versus the $15 for the gallon of acetone at Home Depot. <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that, right. Yeah, you can buy a pretty much a lifetime supply of thinner in one bottle. Yeah, right. Exactly. All right, guys, I got to put this little guy to bed. Okay. All right. Kevin, thanks, thanks. Yeah. thanks for having we really me. Do we really do appreciate you coming. Yeah, no problem. I, I, uh, I, I'm really honored that you guys wanted me to, uh, to come and, and be the featured modeler. I've never had anybody ask me to do that, so that was pretty cool. Fantastic. Glad you're here. Thank you so much. All right. We'll see you guys later. Yes, sir. All right.